If you are pregnant or you've recently had a baby, this podcast is for you. I am your host, Kath Bequee, a physiotherapist working in women's health and mum of three. Join me each week as we dive into all things pregnancy care, childbirth and postnatal recovery, helping you have a wonderful pregnancy and afterbirth experience. And don't forget to hit subscribe so you don't miss any episodes. Well, hello there. Thank you for tuning into another episode of the Fitness Mama podcast. In this episode, I am chatting to the amazing Dr. Cara Thompson, an obstetrician and host of the Pregnancy Uncut podcast. This episode is all about induction of birth. And personally, I think that it's an episode that if you are pregnant, you need to listen to. So forward this episode as well to a friend you know who is pregnant because Cara offers up so much valuable info in this chat and I know you're going to love it. If we haven't met before, my name is Catherine Bequee. I'm a mum of three young girls, a physiotherapist for women, and I have an online community, Fitness Mama, which helps to provide pregnant and new mothers with the exercises, support, and resources they need to feel good from the inside out as they prepare for and recover from childbirth. Fitness Mama has workouts that are tired mum friendly achy mum friendly and toddler friendly that you can do in the convenience of your home at the end of a long day whilst your bubba sleeps or whilst your toddler is running around causing havoc. So as I mentioned Cara is an obstetrician and she's a gynecologist as well and she works in the public hospital system in Melbourne and Geelong specializing in the care of high-risk pregnancies. Cara is a mum of three little girls and in between being a mum and a doctor, she loves running and swimming in the sea down the Great Ocean Road. Cara is passionate about the history and evolution of women's healthcare from a feminist lens perspective and in particular the way we support women to make informed choices about birth. Having gone through a difficult IVF journey to conceive, Cara is conscious that not every pregnancy journey goes perfectly to plan. So stay tuned as Cara is really insightful and informative in this important topic. Cara discusses why might a woman need an induction? What is a process of induction? And she takes us through a bit of a step-by-step journey. She discusses how long it might take to induce someone, Uh, We discuss whether or not the rates of induction are increasing and why this might be. We discuss also what are the side effects or what are the cons for having an induction and do inductions increase the risk of caesarean or instrumental birth. We discuss what is a stretch and sweep and whether or not you can also request an induction of labour if there is no medical indication. So stay tuned. But before we dive in, I do invite you, if you are pregnant or you're postnatal, to come and join the free Fitness Community Facebook group. Simply search Pregnancy, Birth and Beyond by Fitness Mama, and the link is also in the show notes, to come and join this rapidly growing, amazing community of other pregnant and new mums who are all there to support each other and cheer each other on during this crazy and beautiful thing we call motherhood. All right, let's get into this episode with Cara. Thank you, Cara, for joining me today on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Kat. So as I've just mentioned, we're talking all about induction of labor and it's such a big topic and I feel really honored to chat to you. So thank you. For those who don't know who you are, could you please introduce yourself and let us know who you are, what you do and why you do it? Oh, absolutely. So my name's Cara. Um, I'm an obstetrician and it is the best job in the whole wide world. I absolutely love it. I get to go to work every day and hang out with pregnant women and care for them during their pregnancy and guide them through the birth journey and look after them afterwards. And yeah, you know, it's such a cliche to say, oh, it's, you know, it's a privilege to do your work, but it actually is in my case. I just love it. So yeah, I work in Melbourne and Geelong and um, I've recently started a podcast with one of my um, 
women's health um, doctor colleagues um, and we just want to get women's stories out there of pregnancy that hasn't quite gone perfectly to plan, you know, not that perfect Instagram happy um, version of pregnancy. We know there's a lot that can happen and, yeah, we just wanted a platform for people to be able to hear about that and talk about it honestly and feel not so alone if you're someone who goes through one of those complications in pregnancy. Mm, So that's the Pregnancy Uncut podcast and I'll link it in the show notes because it is a great podcast. Okay, so we're chatting about induction. So let's start at the start. Why might a woman need an induction? Yeah, it's such a hot topic, as you say, because it's something that we're discussing and offering and and women are having more and more frequently. So we used to not do that many inductions back in the day, you know, a generation or so um, ago. And then now it seems like, well, it literally is every second woman having her first baby is being offered an induction. So it's it's a huge part of um, pregnancy and birth in our current landscape in Australia. Um, and there's lots of different reasons why your midwife or doctor might talk to you about an induction. So it's basically, it, it, it comes down to something really simple in the end, though, which is do we think it's safer to keep going and wait for natural labor, spontaneous onset of labor and birth? Or is there any reason why we think, hey, on the balance of everything, it might be safer for bubs to be out than in? So that could be absolutely anything. So anything that's up with baby, you know, maybe the placenta is not working as well. Baby might be really small or concerns that um, the growth has slowed down. It could be anything to do with mum as well. So thinking about things like high blood pressure and risk of preeclampsia, um, diabetes, anything at all in pregnancy um, that puts you potentially at a little bit of increased risk. It might be that we get to a point in the pregnancy that we, we think about baby out versus baby in and baby out is looking like the safer choice. Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned that rates of induction are increasing. Why is this? So I think it's definitely multifactorial. So it's not just one thing. I think a big part of it is what our pregnant women are looking like today. And and they look very different than they did a generation ago. So there's lots of different factors that play into sort of that that risk in pregnancy. um, And most of them are increasing. So the, the classic ones that we think about are maternal age. So women over 40, there's some increased risks, especially towards the end of pregnancy. Um, IVF we know is increasing and that can be associated with some risks. Um, Things like the medical problems going into pregnancy. So a generation ago, someone with, for example, you know, heart disease or, you know, a major medical thing just wouldn't have gotten pregnant. Um, And now they are, and and we're managing that in pregnancy. Um, Definitely we're seeing a lot more Uh, diabetes in pregnancy, um, which is a bit of a controversial topic in itself in terms of how we're diagnosing that in pregnancy. But, and that, that is associated to some extent with um, increasing obesity rates. Um, So lots of different things are playing into the demographics of our women who are pregnant now that that was different um, from, you know, even 10 years ago. So that's one thing. Um, I think the other thing is women's uh, approach to induction and to intervention in pregnancy. So I think there's really there's really such a broad range of approaches for women in regards to their birth choices and their pregnancy choices. So there's a, a whole group of women who are super, super, super keen to avoid any intervention. Um, they really want everything to be as natural as possible and, you know, only accept intervention if it's really, really needed, um, which is fantastic. And we're seeing, um, you know, lots of promotion of that approach. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's super important and it's it's really good to have that that balance in, in how we approach pregnancy rather than just be like, you know, we need to follow the guidelines and do these things exactly right from a medical point of view. So that that is definitely makes up a lot of women, but there's also a group of women who are, you know, doing the research and looking at the guidelines and thinking to themselves, hey, you know, if the risk of, of stillbirth, for example, goes up after, say, 39 or 40 weeks, uh, I'm 39 weeks, maybe I don't want to be pregnant anymore, maybe I want to have my baby at 39 weeks. So we're actually seeing a lot of, or some women sort of come in and ask for that intervention, um, which is a, a, a conversation that we can then have about the pros and cons of it. So I think some of it is definitely directed by women themselves. 
The other factor I would say that's definitely changed is that we used to think that induction equals cesarean. So that's the sort of typical thing that if you needed an induction a generation ago, you'd say, well, you've got a really high risk of Caesar. So why don't we wait for natural labor? But over the last sort of five, 10 years, there's been all, all these big studies have come out. They've really showed us really without any doubt that induction doesn't equal Caesar. It shows us that, yes, there is a chance for any woman birthing their baby that a Caesar might be needed, but we don't think the induction process itself is what causes that. So it's a bit of a controversial topic, um, which we can talk about more if you like, but we used to think that because the women who were being induced were the high-risk women. So we didn't just induce someone for no reason. And if you've got diabetes or if you've got preeclampsia or if your baby's very small, you have a higher risk of needing a cesarean. And so we used to think those things went together, induction versus cesarean. Whereas in fact, now we think it was the reason you were being induced is the reason you might have had a higher chance of cesarean. Whereas if everything else is equal, if you come into labor one day or we induce you one day, your risk of cesarean should be the same. It's there, but the induction itself doesn't make it higher. Well, that's good to know. How about the risk of instrumental delivery? Yes, absolutely. So it's not all win-win. You know, when we talk about induction, it's not this perfect answer to everything because there's absolutely no doubt that there are significant risks and um, things to worry about when you think about induction. So, and that's why it's such an individual choice for for each woman. You know, it's not so simple as as saying, you know, induction will fix all the problems because yeah, definitely there is risk to think about. I think instrumental is one of those major ones, especially if you're having your first baby. So we think when you're being induced, it's probably going to be a longer process um, compared to going into natural labor. And we're going to have you most likely on the, on the drip, which is going to give you these strong contractions and they might go on for, for longer and stronger than you would if you're in natural labor. So we find as a result of that, a lot of women are asking for epidurals more than in natural labor. It's a bit of controversy over whether epidural increases your need for a forceps or vacuum, so an instrumental birth. But overall, we think probably in induction, it is a little bit more likely. Um, so there's you know quite a few considerations with that, as you would know more than anyone, Kath. An instrumental birth is is you know, you would never choose it over a natural birth, would you? In terms of the risk of damage to the pelvic floor and to the anal sphincter and to long-term problems with things like incontinence and and prolapse. So no one wants a forceps or a vacuum. Um, And we do think that maybe an induction makes it slightly more likely to need one in your first pregnancy. We don't see that association for women in their second, third or, or or other pregnancies being induced. And you mentioned that there might be an increased need of epidural if you have an induction. Um, is, so is the risk with the, like the forceps and the instrumental delivery, do you think that's related to the induction or more perhaps to the epidural? We have always thought epidural equals increased risk of forceps or, or vacuum. And the thought is, well, if you've got a really good epidural, um, by definition, then you should be having a really good pain relief and a really good block. So you're, you're not feeling baby pushing down on your pelvic floor. And especially for first time mums, you've never pushed a baby up before. So it's hard to sort of know, you know, what direction am I pushing in? Where's the baby? You're sort of, you know, it's really quite numb. Um, and so potentially then it's going to take longer to push baby out. Um, and we're seeing more instrumentals being performed for that. More recently, um, because of this problem, our lovely anaesthetic colleagues are trying super, super hard to to work out the different um, ways that they can administer an epidural, so how much um, medication goes in and what doses, to try and get a good um, pain relief block but not a good um, motor block, meaning that you can still feel a bit and you can still push really well. So the latest research suggests that it, having an epidural doesn't increase your risk of instrumental, but I think it's, um, it's a, a bit of a work in progress in, in terms of our understanding of it and, and how, um, how dense that epidural block is. But I will say pain relief in labor is super important. Um, I think it's it's good to know all this stuff, but I think if you're in labor and you need your epidural, um, you know, it's, yeah, I would say, I would say go for it um, because yeah, it's, it, you shouldn't, you shouldn't feel, you know, guilty or anything like that about asking for the pain relief you need. Yeah. 
great. Okay, so are there different sorts of inductions that might occur for different reasons? Yes, there are. So it, the induction is not a one size fits all thing. Um, there's a few different ways that we can do an induction um, and there are different outcomes in terms of how long the process will take and and, and what happens um, throughout it. So absolutely, it's, it's pretty much dependent on what your cervix is up to. So at the start of your pregnancy and before you're, preg- before you're pregnant, your cervix is usually rock hard and closed and really long. And then throughout the pregnancy, there's a long, slow process of it getting what we call favorable for going into labor. So it turns into a nice, soft, um, soft feeling. It gets shorter and sometimes flattens out completely. And then um, labor, of course, is the cervix starting to open up. So for some women, that process is is already well and truly started by the time they might be um, induced. So their cervix might already be again, what we call favorable or ready to go. So it's nice and soft. It's already open. Baby's head's right down on your cervix. And for those women, we can go straight to breaking their waters and getting you into labor. But more commonly, especially if it's your first baby, we need to go back a step and we need to spend a bit of time softening and ripening your cervix before we can break your waters. So there's a few different ways we can do that. Um, Most of them, uh, they all work pretty much equally well and we all end up in the same position, which is having a nice favorable cervix. Um, But there's a few different reasons why we might recommend one approach over another. And it also depends which hospital you're at for, for no particular reason. Some hospitals are more likely to go down one path than the other, but it's definitely worth having that conversation with your midwife or doctor and finding out what your options are, because there's usually a few options basically. So one of them is to give you something called a prostaglandin. So prostaglandins are the things that it's like a hormone that you're making anyway um, when you're getting yourself ready for labor. So they're coming from the, the uterus and around the cervix and doing all that work of getting your cervix nice and soft and ready for labor. So we can mimic that and give you those prostaglandins, um, which we can give either via something called uh, prostin, which is the gel. People might have heard about having the gel um, or something called Cervidil which is exactly the same stuff but it's embedded in like a little mini tampon um, and it just sits up next to the cervix yeah so same stuff um, the only difference is the cervidil is on a little string like a tampon so if we need to we can pull it out whereas the gel goes in and stays in and then it's absorbed so we can't take it out yeah so they're prostaglandins they usually work beautifully to soften the cervix. Um, They can take a long time though. They might take the whole process might take sort of 12, 24 hours. Really? Um, Yeah. It's a lot. That's yeah. It's one of the myths. Yes. Of induction. I think is that people, we sort of talk to people about induction and say, come in at three o'clock. And I think a lot of people think, oh, great. So I'll have my baby you know, a few hours later. <laughs> and and it's just, it's not the reality. It's, I guess when you think about it, we, we're trying to mimic a really complex physiological natural process that takes, it takes a long time. It's not, it's not the in, you know, naturally your body is not at all ready for labor. And then, you know, an hour later, boom, you're in labor. We know that the natural process is that it takes, it's a slow build over the changes that are happening over weeks to months. So we're sort of trying to mimic that and get it to happen artificially. And, and yeah, it can, it can take time. Absolutely. So can you have that gel and then go home? Usually not. So um, there is one thing you can have to soften your cervix and then go home, which is um, a Cook's balloon, or there's a few different names for them, but basically it's like a little plastic catheter sits up in the cervix. We put a little bit of water in it and it creates some pressure. And that's doing essentially the same thing as the um, gel or the cervidil, just softening and opening the cervix. So some hospitals say, yep, you can go home with that um, balloon in and then come back tomorrow. Um, And some prefer you to stay in. So it's always worth asking about as well. The reason why we wouldn't be keen for people to go home with the gel or the cervidil is that for some women, it can um, start to bring on contractions um, and even sometimes put you into labor. So we do want to be um, checking up on you, checking up on baby, putting on the heart rate monitor, making sure Bubs is happy. Um, because occasionally if you're, if you're having lots of little contractions, so even you're not in labor and you might even be fairly comfortable, um, but the uterus is doing some tightening. And if baby is not coping with that, um, we want to know about that. So we want to, we want to be able to check that you and baby are okay when that gel or the cervidals in.
This episode is brought to you by Baby Bee, Australian owned and designed prams combining quality, safety and style. Not only does Baby Bee let you try their prams at home with free returns for nine months. Yes, that's nine months. They also offer an industry leading three year warranty for total peace of mind. With thousands of five star reviews, around the clock customer care, and up to $300 of free accessories with every pram, what are you waiting for? Go visit www.babybeeonline.com and check them out for yourself. And yes, for listeners of the podcast, there is a 20% discount code. Enter FITBEE, F-I-T-B-E-E 20 at checkout and T's and C's apply. And while your baby's being monitored with the gel in, are you able to move around with that monitoring? Yes, absolutely. So the general thing is you would come in, someone, um, usually the midwife, sometimes the doctor would do an examination. So having a feel of the cervix and working out, is it favourable or not favourable? So people might have heard of this thing called the Bishop score. Often the, the care provider will talk about that, what you're score is basically a score of if your cervix is favorable or not we like to put we like to put numbers and numbers, <laughs> numbers all and things. about numbers yeah, gotta be exactly i hear you <laughs> uh so yes so they'll do that and then if the cervix is not favorable they will talk to you about yeah the cerv- the cervidal or the prostin or the balloon Generally, we do monitor baby before any of those things and then for a period of about half an hour or so afterwards. But then usually you can get up, walk around, you know, go get a coffee, do whatever you like. Um, Most people would sleep with any of those things in and hopefully get a bit of rest um, before the the main show, which is the uh, when we come down and break your waters and get you into labour. Yeah, okay. So you can still have a bit of an active... um, labor in in terms of being upright being against gravity doing some nice pelvic tilts on the ball and all that sort of stuff yeah beautiful yeah absolutely okay so I guess you're taking us through a bit of a step-by-step so let's keep going along this line I love it so you've had they've checked out how favorable your cervix is and they've decided whether or not to put in the gel or um, something to help ripen the cervix You're getting monitored, go for a coffee, take us through the next few steps. Usually the, depends which version it is, but usually stays in for quite a few hours and sometimes up to 24 hours. Um, And then once the cervix is really soft and opening opened up a couple of centimetres, then we can break the waters. So this is where we're now going to birth suite usually as opposed to often the first steps done just in the, like an assessment area or something, um, something else. But once we're going to break the waters, we're coming down to birth suite, you're getting a a midwife um, assigned to your care that will hopefully be able to look after you um, for the rest of your birth. Um, And yeah, breaking the waters and then usually starting that drip, which is the oxytocin, oxytocin drip. So oxytocin is, it's identical to the hormone that we are making ourselves in birth. So it's called, the one we use in Australia is called syntocinin. So it just means synthetic oxytocin, Um, but structurally it's absolutely identical to the hormone that your brain produces when you go into labor. Um, So we're starting that nice and low um, at a really slow rate and we're monitoring mum and we're monitoring baby super closely. So we want to feel your tummy, see how many contractions you're having and just ever so slowly increase that drip um, until we get you into a really good pattern of contractions. So having sort of three to four contractions every 10 minutes um, and balancing that with making sure baby's not getting stressed out on the, on the monitor. Okay. So can I dig into that a little bit? <laughs> because I've spoken to a few midwives who talk about the fact that oxytocin that you get in the drip, it helps with your body's preparation, but is it right? I don't know if I'm saying the right thing here, but it doesn't help with like your own body's natural production of oxytocin which can be really helpful in bonding with your baby and breastfeeding and that sort of thing i've heard this yeah so the concern is yeah is is it is it 
the normal oxytocin that you produce naturally is being produced in the brain is the synthetic version crossing through to the blood brain barrier and having those same um, sort of emotional effects, if you like. I think my understanding is that yes, we're giving you a synthetic version and it's acting on the womb and you're getting contractions and going into labor, but you're still, your body is absolutely still producing um, oxytocin as well, because often if we were to turn off the drip, it's not that you would just stop contracting. So there's still, your body is still in labor and it's still responding and there's, there's still your own oxytocin being produced. So I think I, I definitely understand that the, you know, the real concern about is, you know, what adverse effects are we having by, by doing this artificially versus um, doing it naturally. And I think any, anything like, um, you know, our emotional response after baby's born, our bonding, our um, chance of our milk coming in and successful breastfeeding, it's, that's all super important stuff. I, I personally don't think that there would be any reduction in any of those things. I've never seen someone be induced and their baby comes out and they don't have that you know, that same beautiful response. I think the body is producing so much of its own natural oxytocin that it's, it's, I don't think it's something that, that affects those outcomes. Um, but it is, you know, it's something along with a lot of other things, um, some, you know, some downsides of inductions. There's a huge number of downsides to inductions that every woman has got to balance for themselves because, for some women, as I said, avoiding avoiding any intervention is so important to them. Um, and so for some women, the reason for an induction has to be really, 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 really good. Um, but for other women, they want the induction even if there's no reason. So it's, it's so different for different women. Interesting. Um, and I know personally my first was induced and that oxytocin was working fine. I remember thinking every other baby on the ward was so ugly, but mine was the most beautiful <laughs> I'm sure it was, Kat. <laughs> and I'm sure, like, it's so funny because you see babies now and they're, like, all the same. But I was like, oh, mine's just the most beautiful baby. Oh, I'm sure um, she was. <laughs> so what do you think about, like, you hear about how we can help enhance our own body's natural production in hospital, having the dark environment, um, maybe bringing your own pillow along, having a few photos. What do you think about that? Oh, absolutely. It's super important. So we know, yeah, from, you know, just common sense, but also from studies that, you know, the, if you've got stress hormones floating around, then potentially that's going to have an impact on the way your body's laboring. Anything we can do to, to relax ourselves and have the most, you know, calm, supportive environment in the birth space is incredibly important. And that's going to mean different things for different women. You know, for, for some people, um, they, they're going to want to bring in yeah, things from home, and different lights and different music. Um, some women bring in affirmations and put them on the wall. Um, for a lot of people, it's the main thing is, is who's supporting them and who's with them. So we know that continuity of care is the number one most important thing in pregnancy and birth. And whether that's your midwife, um, for some women, it's you know private obstetric care that they have the same person throughout their pregnancy journey. Um, for some women, that's a doula or another trusted person that they, they feel really safe with. So I think who's with you is, is exceedingly important, absolutely. Um, but yeah, absolutely. There, being in hospital, I think that that's one of the the downsides, definitely, of an induction for a lot of women is it might um, it might disrupt their plans for where they wanted to birth and what they wanted their birth to look like. Um, so if you're someone who was planning, for example, a home birth, or you're planning to birth in a, a birth center as opposed to a hospital environment, um, an induction will change um your ability to do that so that's one of the main factors for a lot of women um but uh, there is lots of things we can do to try and if not be the same as being at home but you know try and um have the, the most calm um environment that we can and try and remove all those hospital elements you know with the bright lights and um you know all the machines and the the um you know the scary sounding equipment as well so i think it's super important absolutely Lovely. So going back on our journey of having an induction, decided to break the waters. Can you keep talking us through? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. For some women, this can be quite a long journey. So we we wish that it happened um, quite quickly. And for some women, it does. We get into to really strong active labor really quickly. Um, but for other women, it can be a real process of, of being on the hormone drip for hours and hours and hours without getting strong, regular contractions and, and starting to open the cervix. So sometimes I think, especially 
in, if we do, if we're not um, told that that's a possibility, that can be really, um, really, really disappointing for some women thinking, why, you know, why is this taking so long? Why am I not getting into labor quicker? Um, but I think it's in, it really important to, to be aware that that that's what can happen. It doesn't mean that there's anything wrong. It's just as we talked about that natural process of labor for some women is, is really quick and sudden. And for others, they do have that really long latent stage of everything building up. Um, and depending on where you were in that process of getting ready to go into labor, maybe you were going to go into labor anyway, really soon, or maybe your body naturally wasn't going to labor for a few more weeks. And so for those people it might take, you know, maybe 10, 12 hours on the hormone drip before we get you into really strong labor. So I can see that would be, you know, that'd be really frustrating. It's a long time, um, but it can be completely normal. So if you're well, baby's well, um, we just sort of set those expectations, if you like, that it can be um, it can be a long process. That's normal. Doesn't mean there's anything wrong. Um, and again, all your pain relief options that you might need are available. Um, if we are not needing the pain relief as well, that's also fantastic because we know um, with, with, as you said, mobilising in labour and um, having that, that birth preparation of what to expect with things like hypnobirthing and, and understanding that, that process of what's happening can be um, really effective as well um, rather than going into it being, you know, not knowing what to expect and being scared basically. Yeah. So does an induction birth feel different to for than for women who go into birth spontaneously? So I cannot talk with any authority because I've not had an induction, but I think talking to women who have had both, who've had an induction of labor and have gone into natural labor, I think there's no doubt it's different. And I think that's the thing. Whenever I talk to women about induction, there's no point being like, oh, I have an induction. It's going to be great. Induction is crap. Like, let's be real. <laughs> no one wants, well, not, you know, no one wants to have an induction as opposed to just going into natural labor, right? The only reason that you would have an induction is because of, for one reason or another, you want everything to start sooner. So it's about the timing. Um, if we had sort of like a magic button or a magic wand that we could wave and you say, yep, you're going to go into natural labor tomorrow, that is 100% going to be better every time because, you know, it's it, yeah, when you're being induced, you're hooked up to the drip and you've got the monitor on and um, it's it's a very much a more of a medicalized process. Um, it often takes longer um, from the time that you come into hospital with your bags to when your baby's born might be like you know, 24, 48, 72 hours. And that might be completely normal. There's nothing has gone wrong there. It just is, is taking that long. So yeah, I think, I think we don't want to pretend that in, induction is, is the same as spontaneous labor. It's not given the choice, you would absolutely choose spontaneous labor over induction. It's only when we start to add potential risks or reasons why waiting versus having an induction might be riskier that we sort of think, oh, is this going to be worth it? I had a, just personally had an induction for my first, but not my second too. And I have to say it was a while ago, but my second birth was more of a challenge than my first and my first was induced. So um, yeah, look, it's, it just shows everything's, everyone's so different, aren't they? And there's just no rule book. And yeah, absolutely. Everyone is different. And the other thing to keep in mind when we're thinking or when someone's talking to about an induction is generally there's a reason why they are. And some of those reasons are really, really strong reasons. And some of them are not so strong, but generally there's something behind that recommendation. And when we're thinking about having an induction or not, I guess in our mind, yeah, we like to think of, do I want an induction or do I want spontaneous labor? And the answer to that is always going to be, of course, we want spontaneous labor. It's you know better on every way, better in every way. Um, but in fact, the reality of our choice, unfortunately, is do we want an induction or do we want to wait? And waiting might sometimes mean going into natural labor, but it also might mean we're still pregnant, you know, a week or two or three later and we're still potentially looking at an induction except at a time when our risk is going up significantly. So um, that's sort of, that's why we think cesarean overall probably doesn't increase with induction because the only option to, the only option if we're not being induced is to wait. Um, and, and quite often that ends in 
a later induction and then potentially the baby's placenta is not working as well. Baby's not going to cope with the stress of labor a few weeks um, later, or potentially the baby's very big and might get stuck um, or uh, quite a number of, of factors um, can progress over that time. That means um, a cesarean or intervention is unfortunately more likely by waiting rather than having the induction earlier. Okay. So we've talked about a few of the side effects and I guess the cons of having an induction. Is there anything we haven't talked about? So one thing that comes up a lot that women are often interested in is something called a stretch and sweep. Um, so I'm not sure if anyone um, offered that to you, Kath, when you were thinking of having your first induction, but it's something that, that I think is a good option. Um, it's not for everyone, but basically what it is, is a gloved finger. What we're trying to do is, is gently stretch the cervix. Um, if we can get a finger through the cervix, um, so sort of massage that cervix. And the idea is that that can release some of your natural um, prostaglandins. So if you remember when we give you the gel or the cervidil, they're the prostaglandins, um, but your body has got their own and, and will release them themselves. So that can sort of start that kickstart that process off. Um, it's a fairly almost entirely risk-free in the sense that it's very, there's not really any um, adverse side effects other than it can be a little bit uncomfortable. Sometimes you get a little bit of bleeding, um, but it's a pretty good, you know, pretty good chance that it might put you into labor or certainly make things more likely um, to be favorable. So all the studies suggest if we do a stretch and sweep for eight women, one of them might go into labor. So that's, you know, for something that's pretty, pretty low in terms of risk, that's something to consider. And you can do, you can keep doing them. So you can do them every, every couple of days or every week. Um, and, you know, if it, if it means you avoid doing a formal induction, um, that's fantastic. So that's something to consider. Um, and that's something that your midwife or, or doctor might talk to you about. So is a stretch and sweep generally offered to most women before they go and they have an induction? It should be offered, I would say, to everyone. There's no reason not to offer it. Some women prefer not to have it, which is, of course, absolutely fine. Um, but I think it should be offered to everyone because if it, if it avoids needing that whole, you know, 24, 48-hour process of induction and you just go into natural labour, that's fantastic. Um, yeah. Can a woman ask for an induction when there's no medical reason for an induction? So if I was talking to you 10 years ago, the answer would have been like, absolutely not. You will be told what you can and cannot have. And, you know, that real paternalistic um, approach um, that we see in a lot of healthcare, but in particular in women's healthcare. So in a short amount of time, women, women are really self-leading this revolution in saying, hey, this is my pregnancy, this is my body. They're really well informed um, and they're reading about um, different studies that are available saying that an induction is a safe thing to do overall, um, that it probably doesn't increase your risk of Caesar if your induction is happening from say 39 weeks. And they're also reading about things that can reduce the risk of stillbirth. So we know that stillbirth is rare, but you know, every week in my work, we, we hear about it and we look after women where it does happen. So it's rare, but it happens. And women increasingly are wondering how can I avoid having, you know, that most awful thing imaginable um, happen to my baby. So we know that there's this stillbirth curve, which is your chance of your baby having a stillbirth goes up slightly from sort of 40 weeks, 41 weeks, and it goes up a, a quite a bit steeper after 42 weeks um, and then 43, 44. It's probably the main reason why we offer an induction for post-dates. So we sort of arbitrarily have just picked a, a time really, say, you know, between 40, 41 and 42, that's when you should have your baby if you haven't gone into labour. Um, and that, of course, is a recommendation. It's not, you know, you can absolutely um, decline that recommendation, but generally that's offered at that time. And the main reason for that is that stillbirth curve um, taking a, a, a turn upwards after 42 weeks. But for some women, that's that risk goes up significantly at an earlier time. So for example, if you're you've had an IVF pregnancy and you're 43 years old and it's your first baby and you've got, you know, potentially other problems like high blood pressure or something like that, um, that curve will actually start to be high quite a bit earlier. So maybe 39 weeks, your risk is starting to go up significantly. It's different for everyone. Um, but across the board, we think that in terms of 
baby. So what's the best thing for babies, short and long-term outcomes? We think between 39 and 40 weeks, that's sort of the, the prime time. So less than 39 weeks, there's, there's so much value in still being in utero, being in mum's tummy in terms of long-term stuff like how, you know, school outcomes and, you know, long-term behavioral problems and things not for everyone, but across the board, when we look at thousands of babies, the earlier you're born, the slightly increased chance that you might have those things down the track up until about 39 weeks. So once you've, once you've hit 39 weeks, baby is cooked, <laughs> ready to go. Um, and the benefit of being pregnant for longer than that in terms of babies, long-term outcomes is, is sort of stagnates from there. And then the risk of stillbirth goes up, as we said, in the later pregnancy. So we are getting women sort of educating themselves about this and then coming in and saying, hey, why can't I have an induction at 39 or 40 weeks if, you know, the only thing that happens after that is my risk of stillbirth goes up. If you're someone who who really wants an everything to be natural, of course, that's not something that will appeal to you and, and, and we would absolutely support those women. But then for the woman who doesn't mind if they have an intervention, they just want you know, they want, want baby out at a safe time, then I think absolutely we should support those women as well. You know, there's no, there's no point supporting women if we're only going to choose which women we support. So I think our role as, as healthcare providers, doctors, midwives is to say, Hey, this is the information. Um, This is what we know is what we don't know. You know, what are your values? What are your preferences? And then support women, whichever way they choose to go, you know, without judgment, um, without bullying, just we're providing, providing information and supporting women in their choices. I love that. Such a good approach. But Cara, I'm going to ask you a question that I think it pops up on social media a lot and it's a bit controversial and I'd love to know what you think of this. There are a group of people who do, you can let me know whether or not, like with statistics and research, what you think, but saying that the medical profession are offering inductions when it's not appropriate and the rate of inductions increasing, but there's no improved rates for mum as a result. So inductions are being offered more and more and more, but it's not helping the mum's outcome or the baby outcomes. It's really tricky to tease it all out because the risks, so our demographics are changing rapidly. So every year we have an increased sort of risk factor profile for our women being pregnant and our babies um, in terms of, yeah, the things we discussed earlier, you know, obesity, diabetes, age, all of that. Um, So I think it's hard to tease out what is related to what? Um, I think the best way to look at it is the studies that we've done that have looked at doing an induction for no reason, um, i.e., you know, the women are just choosing to have an induction. So from from 39 to 40 weeks. Um, and what those studies show is that the firstly, the rate of cesarean isn't increased with induction and in fact is probably decreased again because if we don't have an induction, it means we're waiting and then potentially um, the placenta is not working and potentially we have a higher risk of um, things going wrong later in the, in the um, pregnancy. Um, but it also is not showing any um, adverse outcomes for mum. And we know that the longer we're pregnant, the higher risk of having things happen in pregnancy to mum. So for example, preeclampsia gets more frequent each each week we go in our pregnancy. Um, And so generally, I think it's really difficult to tease out when we're looking at big, big sort of statements like that, what is related to induction, what is related to our demographics, what is related to our Caesar rate. There's so many factors playing into it. Um, I think as well, it's, it's tricky when we sort of read things on social media and then try and, or, you know, any, any media and then try and apply that to our own individual circumstances, because, you know, if, if you're someone who wants to avoid an induction, then you're not going to ask for an induction at 39 to 40 weeks for no reason. And that's fantastic. And we would, you know, no one is going to force you to have an induction of, you know, they shouldn't in any circumstances. Um, but I guess if you're being offered one, then we need to think why, you know, why you're being offered it. Is, is there a really, a really big concern about you or a concern about baby? Um, are the risks of not 
having that induction going to be significantly higher for you. Um, and there's so, there's so much nuance in that if for everyone's individual circumstances is going to be different. Um, so I think it's, it's, one thing to say, I, I don't want an induction and why would any, you know, generally that's going to be most people. You don't want any intervention unless you have to. Um, and then it's another to say, but what if things shift and what if some, a new piece of information comes up that means my baby is at higher risk than normal or I'm at higher risk than normal and sort of looking at that with sort of fresh eyes and an open mind um, because sometimes for you know some circumstances um those those downsides of induction are going to be outweighed because you might be at particularly high risk um and where you sit on that is going to be um it's going to be shaped by so many things but it, it's 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 going to be different for every woman um and it's so important that as, as doctors and midwives we don't we, we don't just sort of say you need an induction end of story because that's not, you know, that's not informed consent and that's not explaining why. And, and, and I think there's definitely circumstances where women are feeling that they were sort of pushed into it without even knowing why. Um, so that's something that as a, as a, a service, you know, anyone looking after pregnancy, that's something we need to improve on. And that's something we need to address is spending that extra time explaining, explaining why, and not expecting women to just do what they're told, but to take that information, apply it to their own personal um, preferences and make that decision and support the woman in that decision. Are there any stats on the success of the induction based on gestation? So do an, uh, is an early induction better like more likely to result in a C-section or is a later? I think you did say it, didn't you? Again, it depends if you're a first-time mum or a, you've had babies before. Um, in particular, if you're a first-time mum, if we do it, try and do an early induction, then there probably is a higher risk of um, cesarean or what we call a failed induction, which is a pretty awful term. Um, you know, unsuccessful, we can't get you into good labour. So that's pretty uncommon. Um, but it is more likely the earlier we try and do an induction. So if we're recommending an induction, for example, at 37 weeks, there's usually a really strong reason for that. Like we're usually really worried the baby's placenta is failing or, you know, we're worried about um, the baby's not going to cope with labour or there's, you know, for example, mum's got severe preeclampsia. Um, so it's not every day that you're going to be offered an induction at 37 weeks. But if you are, we do know that 37 weeks, you're less likely to be ready to go into labour naturally. And so there probably is a higher risk of caesarean at that point. One, because you're less ready for labour, but two, because the reason you're being offered that induction is because there's something going on that's quite out of the, the usual. And then usually, yeah, we see that success rate of induction probably is best around again, 39 to 40 weeks and probably most of 40 to 41 as well. As we go to 41 and certainly beyond 42 weeks, that risk of, a, you know, unsuccessful induction or risk of cesarean is definitely higher. And that again is because the placenta's a placenta is older, it's less likely to support baby through a long labour. We're more likely to see baby getting stuck because um, baby's putting on extra weight each uh, each week of the pregnancy. So, yeah, in a perfect world, um, 39 to 40 weeks going into natural spontaneous labour would be the best and amazing. But, yeah, it's it's not a perfect world. We've got to try and balance up um, these risks of waiting versus risks of intervening. Amazing. Well, thank you. I feel like you've just really helped to... Um, discuss all the pros and cons and I, I reckon this it's really going to be really empowering to help women have a bit more knowledge about induction and why they might have to have it so I thank you. There's so many complexities in it um, that it's it's so hard to sort of talk generally about it because every woman and every pregnancy is different but and everyone's approach is different so um, yeah it's good, good to get all the information you can and um, and yeah chat to your care provider and, and and work out a plan that suits you the best. And that would be your biggest words of wisdom wouldn't it chat to your healthcare provider? Or? Yeah our job is to try and be as yeah as, as um, supportive and respectful and just providing the information absolutely and, and try and get the best outcome for you and bub. Yeah, brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Cara. How can we find more of you? Goodness. Well, yeah, I've got this podcast that is about pregnancy and pregnancy complications, um, Pregnancy Uncut. Um, so if you head over to our Instagram or website and, yeah, just having a listen to some women's experiences about their their own pregnancies that haven't gone to plan can be, um, yeah, really 
uh, really empowering experience to validate your own experience if your pregnancy hasn't gone to plan and yeah it can be beautiful to listen to those stories thank you so much Cara for joining me today pleasure thanks Kath speak soon and before I sign off remember my team and I will be putting together the show notes for this episode with all the links including how to connect with Cara at www.fitnessmama.com forward slash podcast Have a fabulous day, everyone, and I look forward to you joining me next week for another episode of the Fitness Mama podcast.